in October 2013, uh, when I uh, moved to Canada with my family, it was a month in what was supposed to be my grade 12 year. Um, I say suppose it was actually my grade 12 year, but it was pretty stressful, as you could imagine, being the last year of high school in a completely new country. Um, as I began to settle in to this beautiful new city, I also experienced serious changes in how I had to approach things. You see, I was used to this very strict academic culture of Iran. Um, it was all about grades, well, it was all about those academic achievements, and I felt in this new environment, in my new high school in North Burnaby, it doesn't matter as much as I expected it to. It, at points even, I felt that the things that I thought I do well is not even valued as much here. And at that point, I was hearing all about extracurricular activities and leadership. Um, it seemed really foreign. And uh, talk about culture shock. And at that point in time, I had this very deep passion for science. I loved chemistry. Some of you might be, oh, no, but I, I'm proud. Uh, <laughs> I used to have a teacher who would say, there are two types of people in this world, those who love chemistry and those who hate it. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to share that passion. But not being acquainted with all those concepts of leadership and extracurricular activities and how to share one's passions with peers and the world, I felt lost. Fortunately, my science teacher noticed that. She came to me and said, Mohammed, how about you start our school's first science club? And at that point, I was excited. I said, okay, yes, of course, that's good. But uh, what's a club? <laughs> and that's really, um, I guess, the starting point of a journey and that that I've been on over the past five years since moving to this country. And one that's had these two phrases really uh, weaved into it, and that's youth empowerment. We hear the word a lot. It's thrown around as a buzzword all the time. Um, but I just wanted to share a bit about what, what does this concept even mean, and, and what, how do we achieve it? So that's two parts to it, as you can see. Um, youth is one part, and we tend to want to define youth as the stereotypical uh, teens on their cell phones or with headphones and not caring, and there's this idea that youth are um, ap apathetic towards what's happening around them and what's, uh, what's happening in the world. But the second part of that word, empowerment. What does it mean to be empowered? We tend to think that it's about that group dynamic or that moment of success. But do we also think about what leads there? And this, this is, I think, where we start approaching things in the wrong way sometimes because we think that empowerment is about that moment of success. I think it's about those moments of failure. And I have this construct that I've created for myself, this leaning tower of failures. Um, I just put like a couple of the many dozens of uh, letters of rejection and failure. We regret to inform you. Unfortunately, you did not get an interview. Unfortunately, you weren't good enough. I've actually had a case that said once, um, you may feel what you're doing is really good uh, amongst yourself, like you and your peers, but in our applicant pool, um, it may just be average or below average. I like... I like going through these letters much more than I like going through any letter of success because it reminds me that feeling that I had at that point. And it also reminds me of the incredible sources of support that I had, whether it be faith, looking towards the future, my wonderful family who's represented by my cousin today, and coffee. Um, I put ice cream there too. Um, coffee and ice cream helped me get through undergrad. Um, I had a friend who said that um, from first year, when we would get a midterm back, it was like all depressed and everything. 
um, he would say, there is no problem that ice cream can't solve. And boy, was he right. Um, it, it is true. So th these, these are the sources of empowerment that I think I found in my life and everyone can find in their own lives. And going back to that story, that science club, it led me to connect with people in my high school. I started connecting with other science clubs in Burnaby. And soon I joined this organization called the Greater Vancouver High School Science Association. Very, very geeky name, but again, I am proud. Um, and as part of that organization, I suggested, hey, guys, we're doing some great work in Vancouver. How about we like, expand across Canada? And they said, OK, you do it. <laughs> I was like a couple of months into this country, and I was like, I have never stepped my foot outside BC. I don't know anyone in Ontario or anywhere else for that matter. So that's where Google came in. Started looking for people, then started looking for LinkedIn profiles and connecting, and I connected with a lot of people because I had to, I had no choice if I wanted to achieve what I wanted to achieve. And one of the people that I came across was um, a high school teacher in Toronto. And we had a generational gap, probably 30 year age difference. And that didn't hold us back. We, when we were sharing ideas of what we thought science education should look like, what it should be about, the importance of inquiry into science versus science instruction, and I don't want to go into that because, hey, that's not the subject of the talk. We realized that, hey, we really agree on these things. And that is what led us to start this organization called STEM Fellowship. Fast forward three and a half years, that organization is present in almost every province, on 17 campuses, over 100 high schools, and more than 300 volunteers involved. What started with a guy who came here and a teacher in Toronto, uh, I had no idea what a club was in 2013, and it grew. It grew because sharing your passions helps you find other people's. I thought I had to start big, but I realized that I have to start small to achieve the big. And that's, it's not just my story, because the whole point I want to make is that this is something each and every one of you will find in your own stories and in the own passions that you have. So I wanted to share a couple of stories from the incredible people that I've met over the years to make that point. I really want to drive that home. One of the incredible people I met is one of my closest friends now, Jeffrey Ching. He's a second year medical student at UBC. When he was in high school, he was going through a lot of difficulty and he started a mental health club. Um, he'd say that I'm not the smartest person or the most resourced person or the most well-connected person. And he's being humble, but you know, uh, I do joke with him. I, I said, yes, you're right. Um, <laughs> and his mother really did inspire him, as you can see in this picture. And that high school club that he started became the Youth Mental Health Association today, a charity that's sponsored by Lady Gaga's charity and that was also used by the Minister of Health, Canada's Minister of Health. Uh, they, they created a video and, and they shared it on Parliament. So what started as a high school club, two or three years later, was on Parliament Hill. Another story, Bushra. I met Bushra as part of the Canadian Commission for UNESCO's Youth Advisory Group. Her family immigrated from, Canada, from Afghanistan uh, when she was young. She was very, very passionate about refugees and uh, human rights. She, started, she studied political science and international relations uh, on an undergrad and master's level at U of T and then, uh, McGill and U of T. And um, right now she's the youngest ever executive member at the Canadian Commission for UNESCO. I think the next person is at least 20 years her senior. And she's making her mark. She's represented Canada at the UNESCO Youth Forum, which you see the picture in Paris, where the UNESCO headquarters is. And what started as a passion in high school for her has developed into representing Canada on a global stage. Talking about representing Canada on a global stage, I met this wonderful young woman over the past summer. We connected on Facebook. Um, there was, there's a process going on by the federal government to, to establish a youth policy. And I'd been involved in parts of it, and I'd been in contact with, with the Prime Minister's office. And I knew that the process sucked. I complained about it, but I would never do anything about it. Uh, however, Morale had a different approach. She started an initiative, a 
of youth consultations on a zero dollar budget and over the month of, months of July and August, she organized dozens of consultations in, in, in around 50 cities and towns all across the country and engaged around 1,000 individuals, young individuals, to help shape that youth policy, something that the federal government was not able to do, Morrell did, with a zero dollar budget. And Morrell's story is that when she finished high school, she thought she wanted to be an animal vet. She started university, one year in, she realized she hated it. She dropped out, worked at AAW for a year, and started the international relations program over here at UBC, moving from Ontario. And just see what she's done by realizing at a point in time that this is not what I want to do. I need to change my path, even if it means stepping out, working for a year. So courage, that's empowerment. And last, but certainly not least, Tanya is one of the most incredible people that I've met uh, in the same group that I met, um, Bushra. She's from the Northwest Territories. Um, the, the residential schools had a profound impact on her family. She saw drug abuse and alcohol abuse in her community. She was frustrated by it. She was seeing how many of her friends had dropped out and fallen victim to abuse and even committing suicide. She decided to take action in her own community by becoming a community counselor. And then she's also connected various individuals like herself all across Canada. And she's constantly going around and advocating for some of the issues that many of us take for granted and don't even think about. And she would, she, she would say that, hey, I never got a post-secondary education. Uh, and I would say, what, what do you think a post-secondary education can give you that what you just did right now and what you're doing has not done already? And yet again, another story of empowerment. So you may be asking, OK, you shared these stories. You shared your own story. What do we take away from this? I wanted to make a point by sharing stories of immigrants and natives, people from coast to coast to coast, quite literally, and from different disciplines. Because it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter where you live. You, are, you have your communities. It may even be online communities. And there will be issues that you're passionate about. And you need to take action on those issues. And you may think that, hey, this is a global crisis. There's a global poverty crisis, climate change. These issues are big. They're global. They're interconnected. But what can I do? That's where the whole idea about starting locally comes in. Yes, issues are interconnected. But yes, you can start tackling them by starting in your own communities. And that's where this whole idea of thinking global but acting local comes in. So I hope you take that away from this talk by these different stories that empowered youth in that broad definition that we should all uh, approach empowerment and youth with. They think global because they see the interconnected nature of everything. And that's what I was seeing with STEM fellowship the issue with passion for science and how we're approaching education. But you act local. It starts with your community. It starts with volunteering at a hospital. It starts seeing the issues on the ground, taking action locally, in your family even. Or it can be an online community, as STEM Fellowship is. Then it starts to grow. And that's what I want to leave you with. Thank you. <laughs>